Hashem hates us. That's why he's doing this to us. Hashem doesn't like us. That's why he's brought us here. You ever felt that way? <clears throat> well, maybe not that extreme. I don't know if you've ever used the phrase Hashem hates us. I certainly hope not. But that is actually what is brought down uh, in the sources as, as the attitude of the people when they were brought to the uh, the Jordan, if you will, on, on the cusp of going into the promised land, only to find out <clears throat> that there were challenges ahead. A lot of times we we perceive challenges in our life as, you know, God hates us. This is why he's doing this to us. On a deeper level, theologically, you know, it's been said that God gave us the the law of Moses only to show us just how how bad we really are, how sinful we are, or to put it a little bit nicer, he gave us the law of Moses just to show us how much we needed a, a savior, <clears throat> which by the way, is utterly ridiculous. You, Hashem could have just told us, <laughs> by the way, you, you know, here's the deal. But if you think about it in a roundabout way, uh, that kind of goes along the same lines, doesn't it? I mean, God gave us a law really because he hates us, meaning that, you know, we're just so pathetic. He just wanted us to suffer for a few thousand years, kind of do a little proverbial theological head fake. Hey, this law will save you. Psych. No, it won't. Jokes on you. Um, only to turn around and tell us, okay, guys, after a couple of thousand years or so of your utter futility, I've decided to show up and tell you all that stuff I said to you before. Yeah, I was just kidding. All those prophets I sent to you to say, be sure and do the law, which, haha, ha, you can't do. Um, yeah, I was just kidding. It's because I hate you, actually. I mean, if you really think about it, that's kind of the subconscious message, isn't it? And of course, it's silly. Uh, it doesn't have any biblical validity whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of, frankly, if you don't, if you'll pardon the expression, pardon my, my, my uh, candidness here. It's just kind of dumb. But that's what we think a lot of times. We think dumb things. And the reason we do is because ultimately we think that God is against us. You know, I'm, uh, by the way, good morning. Glad you're here. Please be sure and watch this video, or I should say like the, you're, you're watching it, which is why you're here. Uh, <laughs> be sure and like this video, uh, share with all of your friends and uh, subscribe to our channel. And by the way, if you've not yet sub, uh, joined us on the Lapid WhatsApp chat, then please be sure and uh, do that as well. We want you to be a part of of the program. So yesterday I started writing an article just about finished with it. Bezra Tashem. <clears throat> and um, then I'm going to post it to the blog and I'll, I'll be sure and, and put it on the WhatsApp community link so that you guys can see it. Uh, but in that article, I reference Marcion. And uh, some of you have heard of Marcion before. Um, and Marcion's an interesting story. He's an absolute heretic. Biblically, he's a heretic. Uh, the church fathers, uh, interestingly, on the one hand, branded him a heretic, but on the other hand, ostensibly adopted his theology, but not exactly o as open as Marcion put it. What I mean by that is around the, in, the, in the second century, Marcion was an early Christian theologian. He was the one who actually put together the very first Christian Bible, otherwise known as the New Testament. He was a disciple of Paul. That shouldn't surprise you, should it? And Marcion <clears throat> is what I call an honest Christian, meaning that he just voiced what everybody ultimately was teaching. What do you mean by that, Rabbi? Well, he just basically said, look, the God of the Old Testament, by the way, he's the one who coined the phrase Old Testament, New Testament. He coined those phrases. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? 
the, 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 the disciples didn't coin that phrase. Messiah didn't never refer to the Tanakh as the Old Testament. Uh, right? There's no biblical verse in the Bible to support calling it the Old Testament as if it was irrelevant or obsolete or going to be replaced or something like that. So where do we get that term? The Messiah? No. Apostles? No. The Bible? No. Marcion? One guy, not even kidding. Now, what did Marcion teach? He taught that the God of the Old Testament was literally a different God than the God of the New Testament, JC. So JC, the superhero God, had to show up and basically undo, defeat, whatever, the, uh, the Old Testament God. Yes, I'm not making that up. Now, what's interesting about that is that, you know, he was branded a heretic, but real, really, isn't that, ex isn't that kind of like the theology of the church, really? Answer is, yes, it is. Now, do they, do they believe that? Well, no, but they kind of teach it, right? Because JC, basically, everything he taught is antithetical to what was taught in the so-called Old Testament. So not this, not a different God, but different message. You see what I mean? So that's why I called Marcion the honest Christian, because he was the one who basically just was like, hey guys, let's just um, call it for what it is. Well, he got branded a heretic and so forth, but um, he, what's interesting is that his theology stuck. And so did the term Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? It's an, uh, just, can you imagine, like, we're going to call a guy a heretic and kick him out of the community, but we're going to keep all of his terminology. Hmm. Kind of, it, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you, you know, I wish I could say I'm making this up, but I don't do that. I don't make stuff up on this channel. Uh, so, look, he, I, I, this all came to my mind as I was looking at this insight about, you know, Hashem hates us, because really... That theology of fear, because we have, we, I've, I've come to realize that that old Roman theology, the Roman road, is a theology of fear. Um, and, and it makes total sense because rem remember, who invented this gospel? The Romans. How did they rule the world? Anybody study history? Through fear and oppression. We're the Romans. We got a we got a really nice society here. We are, you know, uh, what do you call it? We're civilized. However, if you disagree with us, we will crucify you, and uh, we will burn your town to the ground, and take all of your women and children into slavery. So there's your options, and basically, they're the ones who created the gospel message which is very much a message of fear. Do this, believe what we believe, or else we will crucify you. You better not eat kosher or you will lose your salvation. I am not even kidding. You better not ever disagree with the apostle God, I mean, uh, man Paul, um, or we will... Uh, you will lose your salvation and we will crucify you. We're not even kidding. It is very much a religion of fear. And this fear is born out of God hates us. God is mad at us. You know, sinners in the hand of an angry God, the preacher once said in the 1830s. And so it all comes together. We see this. Is Judaism a religion of fear? No. If you know what's, what's ironic, Judaism is very much a religion of grace. Because Judaism teaches that it's it's interesting because Christianity teaches you can't follow the law of God other because if you break one bit of it, just one little thing, you do one little thing, and he will kill you. That's why you got to get rid of it. See, he gets really, really angry if you break one law, but if you break them all on purpose, he's really happy. It's weird, I know, but trust us, or we'll crucify you. However, Judaism teaches that, look, we're going to do the best we can. And when and if we actually mess up, 
we can come to Hashem and make teshuva. And not only does he accept our teshuva, but he actually will elevate us. So you see, Jews don't run around fearing God. Jews run around trying to get close to him. So bring us back to our story. These are the spies, right? The spies go into the land and they see uh, that the land has promise, okay? But they see the challenges. And we talked yesterday about pessimism versus optimism and how to be a healthy optimist, right? Um, a healthy optimist is the one who looks at the reality of things and takes a realistic assessment of challenges, but has a can-do spirit. Whereas a pessimist ignores the... Uh, or, or, or I should say focuses on the negativity and has a cannot do spirit, you know. Um, and so <clears throat> we want to be that realistic optimist. Now, we don't want to be a nutcase optimist, right? The nutcase optimist is the one who, uh, you know, you don't have two nickels to rub together, but you're, you're running around looking for a Lamborghini uh, because you need a car because you don't have one. And you're, you know, instead of looking at a, I don't know, uh, a Mazda or um, a Chevy Malibu or something, you're, you're running around looking at uh, Lamborghinis because you're an optimist, but in reality, you're just a nutcase. Uh, so, <laughs> so we don't want to be that person. Don't be a nutcase, right? All right. So, but, but I want to read this insight from the Kehot Humash um, because it's a really interesting insight. Uh, because what we're going to see here, to give a little bit of credit to the, the 10 spies who were bad, what, what we see is they saw a little bit more than just giants. I mean, giants are bad enough. Um, so these guys, understandably so, on the one hand, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be too hard on them because, you know, <clears throat> if you and I saw this, what I'm about to read to you, we might have been a little bit shaken ourselves. But it doesn't change the fact that that's you and I. However, we also didn't live through an entire year of the plagues of Egypt. We also didn't live through parting the Red Sea. We also didn't live through a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. We also didn't live through the manna. We also didn't live through the supernatural miraculous well. We're not talking about a, a drinking fountain here. We're talking about a well that produced rivers, streams of living water in the desert. Um, you know, and, and, and then the, all the other miraculous things that were going on here. You and I didn't experience that. These people did, and therefore they should have had a, bit, a lot more faith. It's one thing to believe in God when, like you and I are right now. We're like, we believe God. We believe God is going to do supernatural things. But when we see open miracles pretty much every day, well, not, not pretty much, there's no, that's not, what am I saying? It is every day. Every day open miracles, we should have, we should have had more faith in this. But this is what they saw. <clears throat> it says, we saw, uh, yeah, we saw there, and by the way, this is from chapter 13 and verse 33, reading from the Kehil Tumash again. So keep in mind, this is, and the expanded version, bringing in a lot of uh, ancient insights and so forth. It says, we saw there not only the mortal giants we mentioned before, but also supernatural giants, that is, fallen angels, who are descendants of Og, a giant descendant from the original fallen angels, Shem Kazai and Azael, who assumed material form and descended to the earth in the days of Enosh. These angels were involved with the beginning of idolatry, so their race is therefore quite capable of rebelling against God. Even the names of these angelic progenitors indicate rebellion and destruction. Sham Kavzai means vision of desolation, while Azel means a mighty angel and is phonetically similar to Azel. 
the name of a desolate rocky cliff. Furthermore, since their descendant, Og, survived the flood, it is clear that God has made at least some members of this race immune to divine punishment. And these giants were much larger than the mortal giants we saw in Hebron. We look like grasshoppers to ourselves next to them, and so did we see seem to them. For we overheard, now I, I brought this up yesterday, right? I said, how did we know we look like uh, grasshoppers in their eyes? Well, here we have an insight that kind of gives us an answer to that question. It says, we overheard them saying that there are ants in the vineyards that look like people. Okay. So now it doesn't mean they were talking about them necessarily, but they're saying to themselves, well, if they saw ants and they thought they might be people, then maybe that's the way they think about us. Again, that's not because they asked them, but they're just putting, they're making an assumption based on what they're hearing. So it says, when they heard, this it continues. So, so by the way, so here we are seeing, seeing this and saying, okay, my goodness. It's not just giants, but we're talking here about fallen angels. So just to, like, as I said earlier, just to give a little bit of empathy to the 10 spies, understand that these are pretty significant obstacles. However, I just went through the whole reasons why we could have, should have believed in Hashem. But it continues on here in chapter 14 and verse 1 in the Kehot Tumash. When they heard that it would require supernatural power to overcome the inhabitants of the land, the people did not believe that God would manifest such power. Here's where we start to get into issues. They, they knew that it would require supernatural power, but then their faith began to wane. The entire congregation of judges, the 70 elders, raised their voices and shouted, and the people wept all that night, the night of the ninth of Ab. Now, remember I said yesterday that the, uh, the spies were all distinguished men. And I said that you have to, as a leader, you have to be careful. And to one degree or another, ladies and gentlemen, you are all leaders. Now, what I mean by that is that there's different le levels of leadership. And I want to speak to this for just a second. Because there are leaders within our community who, who have official positions of leadership. And then there are, you know, the members of the community. However, to one extent or another, we're all leaders because a leader, by definition, is someone who leads somebody else, somebody who is an example to someone else, someone who is uh, maybe mentoring someone else. And just like in the military, there are different ranks and there are certain ranks that are <clears throat> very senior ranks. And therefore, they have command, as it were, over very large, sometimes I should say, large units. And then there are the privates and the corporals, and in the case of the Marine Corps, the lance corporals. Well, even a private in the military can be a leader because a private might have a command, if you will, over maybe uh, another private to whom. He is senior. And Lance Corporal could have command over a fire team, for instance, of four Marines. So everybody is a leader to a certain extent. And you, you, this is why we have to be careful that we don't lead people astray by our lack of faith and our lack of, of bitacon, trust. But going back to our story, what we're seeing here is the whole mayhem is being led here by the leaders. And I want you to understand how disastrous this is. First of all, you have the 10 spies that come back. These are distinguished men and they're, they're spreading a negative report. And then you have, <clears throat> you have the elders. You have the, this is the Sanhedrin. And it, it's, it's, um, 
this is a mess. But they're weeping all night long and they're crying out. It says all the Israelites except for the except for the tribe of Le Levi complained against Moses and Aaron and the entire congregation of judges said, if only we had died in Egypt or if we had died in the desert. Why is God taking us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be spoils of war. It, it, is it not better for us to return to Egypt? <clears throat> the men said to each other, let us appoint a new leader and return to Egypt. And let us worship a new God, hashtag Marcion, and return to the religion of Egypt, hashtag the religion of Rome. The women, however, did not rebel. Now, isn't this interesting? You know, why did God bring us here? Has anybody ever felt, we talked before about the fact that <clears throat> You know, Le, the Lapid movement right now, we are, we are in the pioneering stages. You know, there are other Orthodox Jewish sects um, like, you know, Chabad and Aish and Breslev and so forth. And, uh, you know, they have congregations everywhere and they have lots of resources and publications and you know, wonderful websites that are all fleshed out. And, um, oh yeah, it's great. It's great. Right. Each of those three groups I just mentioned, and there, there's others, of course. How, I mean, but like Chabad has been around for what? Well, since the mid 1700s, Breslev has been around since the early 1800s. Uh, Aish, I don't know how long they've been around, but it's been it's been a, it's been a couple of years. Uh, Lapid Judaism has been around since 2014. Uh, to put things in perspective, do we have synagogues across the United States or the world yet? Not yet, but give us a second, okay? Um, and what I'm trying to say is, is that if you're a member of Lapid Judaism now, if you consider yourself a, P P a member of the Lapid Nation, you're the pioneers. You're the ones in the wilderness right now. You're the one standing on the bank bank of the Jordan looking over across and seeing the giants. And we just have to understand that's where we live right now. How many of us have said, you know, this is a little bit kind of rough. I'd rather go back to Egypt. And hey, I got an idea. Let's create a new God and a new religion because it seems kind of tough. Right. And it is. It's not easy. It's, just, it's no joke. By the way, did you know that Hasidic Judaism in general, some of you know this already because I've told you, but. Hasidic Judaism in general, of which uh, Breslev and Chabad is a, a, are a part, but I'm talking about going back to the Baal Shem Tov. Did you know that when Hasidism erupted, which in the mid the mid 1700s with the Baal Shem Tov, did you know that it was universally opposed by all of Judaism to the extent that there were bans? against Hasidism and that if you were a Hasidic Jew, you were, if you were an Orthodox Jew or, or by, back then there was no such thing as Orthodox reform. Everybody, every Jew is Orthodox. But if you were a Jewish person and you were forbidden from even renting a room to a Hasidic Jew, you couldn't eat their meat. You couldn't marry their daughters. You couldn't give your daughters in marriage to them. It was completely forbidden, and they were opposed. Their chief opponent, who led all the other rabbis against them, was the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon, who is one of the most revered of all rabbis to this very day. And that opposition, fierce opposition, you understand what I just said? Compl they burned their books. The Vilna Gaon wrote many harim, many bans against the Hasidics, and they burned their books and all their publications in the city squares. This oppression lasted for about a hundred years before Hasidic Judaism was even considered a legitimate Judaism. We started in 2014, in case you're wondering the official launch 
of the Lapid Judaism vision. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, is that we have to have that pioneering spirit. This is the lesson we're learning from this message. We're not just studying a historical event here. This is us. Hashem doesn't hate us. He didn't bring us to this pioneering movement because he hates us. He didn't bring us to the wilderness because he hates us. He didn't bring us to the Jordan to cross over and take the land because he hates us. But this is what the people thought. In fact, this is what Rabbi Monk says in his commentary. By the way, these these elders are crying. Everybody's crying. Crocodile tears. Um, they were saying in verse 31, for it's too strong for us. It says here, Rabbi Monk says, we cannot conquer the inhabitants of the land, for they are stronger than us. However, the Hebrew, Mimenu, Mimenu, can be tr can be translated than him. This provides an opening to the Midrashic interpretation of the verse. Here, as in so many other passages, the literal and Midrashic meaning are not in contradiction, but explain the text in two different ways. According to the Midrashic explanation cited by Rashi, the spies were comparing the strengths of, of the inhabitants to Hashem himself and not them. That's crazy, but what, what the spies ultimately, and this is where pessimism will get you, depression will get you. They began to say, they weren't saying, in other words, if you look at the Hebrew, they weren't saying, look, the, the land is too strong for us. These giants are too strong for us. What they were really saying is they're too strong for a shim. Eventually, I'll be talking about David, the David and Goliath story. But just to bring down an insight for the Midrash about Goliath. Remember, he was a giant. It says that Goliath was <clears throat> um, standing out in the field, cursing Israel and so forth. But the Midrash brings down that he was crying out to them, saying, bring me your God. Goliath wanted to fight Hashem. Goliath wanted to fight Hashem. Now, David, knowing that Hashem's not going to manifest himself and fight Goliath because that he doesn't have to, Hashem realized that he could be Hashem's representative. And so, when David heard Goliath say that, David's response was, I'm your huckleberry. If you want to fight Hashem, fight me, because Hashem will fight through me. But that wasn't the attitude here. The attitude here was, these guys are greater, stronger than God. It's crazy, right? But this is where our pessimism can get us and get us into delusion. The spirit of fear can get us into delusion. I talked earlier about the fear of the Roman religion. It's nuts. I want to tell you something right now, and I, this is going to comfort you. It's going to comfort you, so it should comfort you. Hashem, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will never send you to hell for being obedient to his word. Isn't that nice? Let me say that again. Hashem will never punish you. He will never send you to everlasting damnation and the lake of fire. Which, it, which is what it means when you say you'll lose your salvation. He will never do that because you're obedient to his word. So when you study the word of God and you, you because you love him and because you're born again, you strive to live a Jewish life according to the law of Moses, which is, by the way, what every single prophet, to include Yeshua, told you to do. Um. Hashem will not send you to hell for that. But the fear created by Rome is, if you dare, how dare you? How dare you? If you dare attempt to follow the word of God because you love God, you pathetic something else, he will send you to hell. He will crucify you because that's what Romans do. It's nuts. But, but that's where pessimism leads you. Pessimism will lead you to nuttiness. Okay, so look at what it says here. The people went all night. They wept, they wept, excuse me. They wept all night. 
Our sages teach that it was the night of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, which is, as I said yesterday, one of the um, remembrances of that day. A, per, a precursor to the exile, which would last for 2,000 years. Now, this is a clear hint to this connection in Psalms 106, 24 through 27. Moreover, they scorned the desirable land. They believed not in his world, and they complained in their hearts. Therefore, he swore that he would scatter them among the lands. Why is Hashem bringing us to this land, they said. These were the words that despised Jews when they secretly fomented discontent among the people in their tents. You see, this is we, we've got to be careful that this secrecy, we talked about this, going around talking privately and so forth. This is what they did. They went around secretly. You know, what they what, what they actually did was they 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 went around tent to tent and they said, I have a prayer request. I need prayer. Because that sounds so holy, holy, holy. I have a prayer request. What's your prayer request? How, how can I pray with you? Well, and they started to blab it all out. <laughs> a lot of people will, will, will conceal their Lashon Hara in a prayer request. Ooh. So anyway, it says, um, Moses later referred to this as, as follows in Deuteronomy 1, 26-27. Yet you would not go up, but you rebelled. And you complained in your tent, saying, because Hashem hated us. See, it's re actually recorded in the Torah. This was their complaint. Because Hashem hated us, he has brought us up out of Egypt to deliver us into the land of Amorites to destroy us. But, and it goes on to say that as a result of their complaining, and their fear and their lack of faith, their protection, literally their shadow. The word for protection is shadow, which is a whole other topic. But their shadow left them. Does Hashem hate us? No. Hashem oftentimes puts us in situations so that we can have faith in him and press forward. Can we defeat, defeat the giants? Well, we by ourselves? No. But with the power, the supernatural power of Hashem, absolutely. And as a result, that's what we're doing and that's what we're going to do. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being a part of this program today. I hope it's been educational, inspirational, and inspiring. We will look forward to being back with you, manana with God's help, for the fourth Aliyah of Parash al-Shalach and see to what else we can learn from the valuable insights of this Torah portion. Thank you for being here. Please uh, like this video, share it with all of your friends, comment on it, subscribe to our channel. Be sure and click the bell icon to make sure you stay up to date on all the uh, uh, things that we have coming up and so forth. It will notify you. And be sure and uh, send Katura a link so that you can join our WhatsApp chat and be a part of that wonderful community. So God bless you. Look forward to seeing you manana. Don't be scared.